What's up, skeptics? Thomas Westbrook here. If you are not familiar with your Bible, then you are in for a treat. You are about to hear an absolutely amazing story. The story of the day the sun stood still. You heard me right. The day the sun stood still. Strap in. 40 years after the story of Moses and the Exodus, which I debunked in episode one of this series, by the way, Joshua is leading the Israelites into the promised land. The same Joshua who allegedly brought down the walls of Jericho by screaming at them. <laughs> Joshua is genociding his way through the land of Canaan, slaughtering entire cities full of people left and right. The five armies of the Amorites don't want to be destroyed, so they join forces to stop him. God doesn't like this at all. So he launches hail at the Amorites, killing more of the enemy with hail than Joshua's entire army managed to slaughter. Now, if you're not familiar with how hail works, let me put that into perspective. In the United States in 1995, the costliest hailstorm in history hit Mayfest. Over 10,000 people were caught in the open with softball-sized hail. Only 4% of them were even injured, and not one single person died. No fatalities reported that night in Fort Worth, but plenty of injuries. That's because dying from hail is extremely, extremely unlikely. And in the last 20 years, only 4 people in the entire U.S. have died from hail. Compare that to about 6,700 who drowned in bathtubs over the same time frame. If God's going for a miracle, why not just rapid fire some bathtubs at the Amorites? Oh, and incredibly, none of Joshua's army was hurt by this hailstorm slaughter fest that they were right smack dab in the middle of. But we haven't even gotten to the amazing part yet. Joshua didn't just want to win the battle or to make a point. He wanted to entirely wipe out the Amorites. But I guess God ran out of hail and Joshua was running out of daylight, so he commanded the sun and the moon to stop in the sky for an entire day so he could have extra daylight to slaughter his enemies by. Um, Cool story, but there's just one gaping flaw. The sun doesn't go around the earth. <laughs> If God is omniscient and the Bible is of divine origins, you'd think he'd at least be able to get heliocentrism right. Uh, in order for the sun to stop in the sky, the earth would have to stop spinning. And that's kind of problematic. You see, at the equator, the earth spins at over a thousand miles per hour. If the earth stopped spinning, everything and everyone would be launched eastward at 1,000 miles an hour, similar to a car slamming on its brakes when you're not wearing a seatbelt. Only a lot faster. It wouldn't be quite fast enough to be launched into outer space because escape velocity is 24,800 miles an hour, but buildings would be leveled, thrown sideways, and ground to rubble. Tsunamis from the ocean would be so high you wouldn't be able to see the top. They'd sweep across the land, drowning the Earth. Now, the atmosphere would keep spinning, but the Earth would stop, creating massive dust clouds moving faster than an atomic blast, resulting in hurricane-strength winds all across the planet. Now, the Earth would stop spinning, but the molten core inside of it would keep spinning and sloshing, resulting in insane tectonic forces, earthquakes, and volcanic activity. Potentially super volcanoes, which by themselves can result in a global mass extinction event. The Earth is literally ripping itself apart from the inside out. And after the battle, when the Earth speeds back up, everything not strapped down would stay put as the Earth spins into it, bitch slapping life for a second time in one day. <laughs> Some Bible scholars excuse away this ancient hunk of pseudoscience by saying that the Earth didn't suddenly stop. It just slowed down for a day. But there are still major problems with that. Problems that an insulated Bible scholar may be oblivious to, but a scientist won't let you get off that easily. First, purely from a scriptural standpoint, that is not what the text says. It says that the sun and the moon stopped, not slowed down. But let's ignore that for a second. The Earth's spin causes a centrifugal force, resulting in a bulging effect. In other words, the oceans bulge outwards at the equator. If it were to slow down or stop spinning, even for a day, the oceans would be displaced to the poles, putting the entire northern and southern hemispheres underwater. Ancient Scandinavian, Russian, North and South American, South African, and Australian civilizations would be drowned 
and not in a good way. And yet these civilizations date back well over 3,000 years and amazingly weren't wiped out or even affected by this whatsoever. And not a single geologist has found evidence for this catastrophic flood that would have affected only the northern and southern hemispheres, but not the strip of land around the equator. Now this passage in Joshua also says that the moon stopped in the sky. Well, unlike the sun, the moon actually does orbit the earth. And the only thing stopping it from crashing into the earth due to the pull of earth's gravity is the fact that it's moving so fast. But even if we ignore everything that we know scientifically about the earth's rotation and the moon's orbit, which devastates this ignorant tale, there's another major problem with this story. If the sun is your only source of keeping time, and you measure time based on its relative position in the sky, or use sundials to track time, how do you know that the day was actually longer? Nowadays, we have digital and mechanical clocks kept in sync with atomic clocks measuring time based on the number of oscillations of the outermost electron of a cesium-133 atom. But 3,000 years ago in the heat of a battle, how could they possibly tell that the day was longer than any other? other, other than by their subjective perceptions of time, which we know are incredibly deceptive. Lock someone in a room with no daylight and their internal clock is thrown completely off. They say that time flies when you're having fun, like when you're slaughtering the Amorites, but it's really just the opposite. At the end of a day packed full of different activities, we look back at the morning and say, was that really all today? The more that you do in a day, the more memories that you pack into a day, the longer it subjectively feels. It feels like time itself was longer. And now in order to get around all of these problems with this story, Bible scholars have come up with no less than seven different interpretations for this passage. And Christians can't even agree on it. As some argue that it's actually talking about an eclipse, but come on, this passage says that Joshua commanded the sun and the moon to stand still, and the sun and the moon stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. Does that really sound like an eclipse to you? And the passage says that there has never been a day like it before or since, but we've had thousands of eclipses over the last 3,000 years. They claim that it's a mistranslation from a Babylonian text, but then doesn't that call into question the inerrancy of the Bible? If a solar eclipse is mistranslated as the sun and and the moon standing still in the sky and the day extending, then how do we know that the Levitical command to slaughter all abominable homosexuals isn't actually a mistranslation of the Babylonian prophecy that in the year 2005, Brokeback Mountain would be on sale at 100% off on LimeWire? I wish I knew how to quit you. That joke did not age well, did it? That in the year 2020, Brokeback Mountain would be on sale at 100% off on Pirate Bay. You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. But you have heard of me. Finally, there's the last bit. There has never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord has listened to a human being. What? Billions of people literally pray to God every day, but their own Bible says that the Lord doesn't listen. This entire story is a mess and single-handedly presents a crisis to the Christian faith. And before some Christian comes wobbling into my comments to tell me that I'm taking it out of context, stop. Come back to me when your side can agree on what the context even is. Because until you have some kind of consensus, you're left with nothing but internal confusion and are arguing between your own ilk. Yet here's a passage so preposterous that any fifth grade kid in science class knows it's nuts. You know what I call the Bible? I call it the history book of the universe. <laughs> You're a funny guy. And Christians can't even agree on the interpretation. According to 1 Corinthians 14, 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. But to quote my friend Alex, if God's not the author of confusion, then he's not the author of your Bible. And this is yet another example of how nothing fails like Bible history. If you value well-researched videos like this and you want to help me push back against the demonstrable bullshit of organizations like Answers in Genesis and Focus on the Family, then the number one way that you can help me to grow and increase the reach of videos like this one is by making an ongoing pledge at patreon.com slash holy kool-aid. I have a bunch of goals listed there so you can literally watch as we hit them. We'll hire additional editors, researchers, assistants, a marketing team, and so much more. Or you can make a one-time donation on PayPal. Thank you as always to all of my current patrons and donors for your ongoing support. Y'all freaking rock. And as always, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.